Hugs. Well, today is English paper piecing. And we are going, this is a beginner English paper piecing story because I have gotten to where in my older age, I am having some trouble seeing as well as I used to see. And so very nice, uh, delicate applique is a little bit more difficult for me, uh, especially needle turn and some of those things. And I can't do them when I'm riding in a car. So if we're traveling, I can do English paper piecing with relative ease. So our beginning business here is a one inch hexagon, which means they are one inch on each side. A hexagon has six sides, of course. And what you need to do first, I think it's, it looks like it's about five after one. So I think we're gonna go ahead and get, get going. What, in order to make the hexagons, you need to have fabric, you need to have your paper pieces. And the paper pieces you can get at, I think it's paperpieces.com. You can get them at quilt shops. The back door has a lot of paper pieces, a lot of different types to choose from. Or you can make them with heavy weight or maybe two or three layers of freezer paper. And of course, as much as I do them, I like to just go ahead and buy the paper pieces rather than make them. So for this um, size hexagon, you need to cut your fabric two in, at two and a half inches. That allows you to have about three eighths inch to turn over the paper. English paper piecing uses paper and you turn the fabric over the paper to make shapes. So what we need to do first is, I'm getting out another little help. This is an acrylic hexagon and I use it to cut my hexagons. You don't have to have that. If you have just a plain, your paper hexagon, you can take your fabrics and let me start with my fabrics here for the, the flowers that i make i like to have a dark center a light a dark center a light inner ring and then a darker or medium outer ring so i i just happen to have either black or gray, some dark color for my centers. And this is some fabric I had. And then here's my inner ring, and here's my outer ring. So I took these and before we started today, I cut them into two and a half inch strips. The black, I already had in, in two and a half inch strips. As you can see, I've already cut it. What you can do is you can lay your uh, paper piece, if you have your paper piece, right on top and you can just basically scissor cut or use your rotary cutter if you're careful and just give yourself three eighths of an inch on each side. And it works pretty well. You can even take a pencil and or a white pencil, draw around there, and then cut it with scissors. But if you have an acrylic cutter, it's a lot faster. These also are available from paperpieces.com or from book shops. So I'm gonna lay my acrylic cutter right there. And now this black is folded. It looks like I've got four layers here. And then I'm just taking my cutter and I'm going to go cut, cut, and flip it around and cut the other two sides. This way I can make my pieces pretty quickly. Now I have four 
black pieces. I only need one for today. This piece will be big enough to go around my paper and have about three eighths of an inch on each side. All right. So what you will need to do for one flower is to have, you need six pexies for the inner layer. So I usually just take one strip and fold it over. I lay my cutter on top or my template on top and I cut them two at a time. Just like the black one. The thing I like about this clear uh, template is that if you have a fabric that has some interesting design in it and you want to get just a certain thing, you can see that you can see where it's going to fall on your fabric so you can plan how you want your inner fabrics to work. Okay, so you need six, so I would have to make two more cuts from here to get six of these. I'm not going to do that right now, but that's how you do it. Okay, for the outer layer, you need to have a double that, so you need to have 12. So I usually take two strips, and I, I don't know how long these strips are. These strips are about 18 inches. I think I cut from a half quarter. And then do the same thing. Now this time I'm cutting four at a time. It makes it a lot faster to cut more than one at a time. It also means that you have to have a nice sharp cutter, which there you go. So now I have four. I'm going to do three more of those and end up with 12. And then generally I take this is the one black one. What I do is once a day, or I mean once every so months, so many months when I need more, I will go through and spend an afternoon, maybe two hours or so, gathering fabrics and cutting fabrics and putting a little package together that has a dark, six medium, six lights, and 12 mediums. I put them in a bag or I clip them with a clip. What? Oh, there are some people. There's some people out there. Thank you, love. I'm glad to see that. Well, oh, I can't see it that way. Can I see it that way? Oh, I can't. Kind of you have to have it this way. Oh, boo. Okay, well, I'm going to sit right there. Hi, Jean. Hi, Sandy. Pam, Rosemary, Susie, uh, Susie's here already, and Lisa. Oh, yay! It's good to know that there are some people there. I'm going to have to skin this up some of this. Da, 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 da. Ah. Okay. Moving on. So, anyway, back to what I said. I have bags of these. I will put them in a little bag, and then before I go somewhere, I'll pull out nine or ten bunches and think, while I'm on this trip, I'm going to make nine flowers. And usually I get home and I make maybe three. But you've got them in case you need them. So that is part one. Part one is cutting out the hexes. These are really handy. If you don't have those, I would suggest getting them, but they're, they're not a showstopper. So let's move on. I'm going to stick all that right here. All right. Part dos. Now. Once you have your bag of pexies, here's a blue one. 
and it's all ready to go. So now we have to get them ready to sew. This is when you need paper hexagons. Make sure that you make sure that when you get them that they are the right size. But every all the different ones that I've gotten have been one inch on a side. You take your fabric. I always start in the middle because you always have to start sewing in the middle. And I lay the fabric wrong side up. I lay the paper on top and then I fold one of the seam allowances down and I press it with my chubby little thumb or a finger and I put a little tiny clip on there. If you don't have a clip, you could use a little tiny clothespin. I just find that these little clips are very handy for that and you only need two. So then I go to the opposite side and I fold the fabric over the paper, and I put another clip on. So it looks like that. And then we're ready to baste. So. Oh, and for basting, the thing I like about basting is you can use the thread that you bought 20, 30 years ago. This, I don't know how old this is, but I've got some thread. A lot of my thread is still on wood spools. This thread costs 45 cents. And it's cotton wrap polyester. I don't really care what kind it is. I don't use real the upholstery thread or anything, but use your cheap crummy thread because you don't want to use this sewing in your sewing machine, but you do want, it's fine for basting. Thread a needle, no knot. Take your piece that you have clipped, and I start with the side that's, because I'm right-handed, I start with the side that's to the left of my one of my clips. And I just fold this down. Can you see this really close there? And I press it with my finger. So that there is a nice 45, this is black, it's probably not very easy to see this black, but there is the fold line. And then I take my needle and I'm going to go under, just in the fabric. I'm not touching, I'm, I'm touching the paper, but I'm not going through the paper. And I leave a little tail there and hope that he stays, sometimes he does. Then I'm going to take a stitch again. I have a really long thread. I have a tendency to use really long threads because I don't like to read thread. Okay, so I've got one stitch just in the corner and it's covering the nice 45 degree line. So that's folded down. Now I go to the next corner and I'm going to press this edge down in the same way and I'm pressing it with my finger and my thumb. And then I'm going to take another stitch just in the fabric. It's only catching the fabric, but it's catching both sides. And take a stitch through there. I don't know if you can see that little stitch there, but it's just holding the fold down, basically. Now I have to take out my clip because on the next edge we're going to Press, press down, just like we did before, and make a stitch right in the corner. And we keep going, we move on to here, press down, make a stitch. This can get, you can do this pretty quickly once you get the hang of it. And finally we come to the end and I press down this one. Well, I'm not at the end. I shouldn't have said that. Make one more stitch. Okay, so now I'm at the, the one that I, I just took the clip out of. I'm going to go there, make a stitch. I'm going to go 
go around six corners because there are six sides. Okay, now we're back to the front. And when we're at the last one, I always go and make one more stitch right in the first one again. So that one ends up with a double stitch, but that's okay. That means I don't have to do a knot. We don't want to make a knot. So then you take scissors and you're done. You have one ready. Now there's an alternative, well, there's two other alternative ways to do this. This is my fave way. Can we see that down there? Is that better? And this is my favorite way. Another way to do it is if you have freezer paper, which I, I don't have right now, but what you can do is I'm looking for, oh, I see it. Oh, I'm going to need those guys too. This is where I should sing or dance, but I can't do that. Not very well. Neither one. But okay. An alternative way with hexes, and I don't have any hexes done, but I do have some other paper pieces is if you have freezer paper, that is the shape that you're using your paper piecing on, is you can use a basting thread and actually baste right through the paper. This is, I forget what the shape is called, but I used it sort of like a long, I don't know, you probably know what it's called, some of you experts out there. But, um, you can stitch right through the paper if the paper is thin. This thick paper, um, I guess you could stitch it, but it would be kind of hard on your hands, I think. So you can stitch through the paper. That's the that's one way. The other, another alternative way is to use glue, and I will do one here with glue. I don't generally use the glue. But I know a lot of people do, and they really like it. They fold this down, and they take and just use some temporary, uh, temporary glue stick, make just a little s swipe across there, and stick it down. And then I think they go right around the. They don't do opposites like I did for the pasting. They just go scooting around the the shape. And I have done some of these like this. It, it's much faster, but I have, I seem to have trouble removing the paper and the papers don't come off quite so easily for me. Now maybe I'm just using too much glue, I don't know. But it's another way and it's, it's even faster than doing the method that I did. Mainly, you need to get that fabric over the paper and have it ready to put together. Okay, so that's basting. Now, we are going to move on. You have to baste all 19 pieces. You need to baste your center, your six inner, and then your 12 outer. And I know if you're sewing at home, you've probably got those just about finished. But I did have, I got mine done, at least partially done, so that we can move on. Here are some that are basted together. I have dark center. This is my medium, or my light centers, and then this is going to be a red outer So, I take these and I put them together, and I put 
going to line them up so that I'm on one of the sides, have them right sides together, and I just flip them so that they are right sides together, and I'm looking at one edge. So then I need thread, and maybe I will use this needle. Right here, which means I have to thread my needle. The thread that I like to use for the real sewing, not the basting, the thread I use for the real sewing is I like to use silk thread if I have it because it does sink in really well and you don't see it. I also like to use a poly thread that's fairly thin. Um, and you can use cotton and poly thread. You can use cotton thread. I was watching TV the other day and this Invisa, Invisafil, Invisafil was a one that says, don't you have to be able to watch your thread? Uh -huh. Let's see, this is way too long a thread. Do not do that. That's that's going to be a mess. With the silk thread, I have to do a little bit more. Scooping around. Okay, so <laughs> when you have a thread that's a little too long, you really don't. Okay. 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 Sometimes I put the thread through one of those wax things. That seems to help. Okay, we're ready to sew now. We're going, to, and I'm right handed, so this, but this is why I do it. I start a little back from the from one corner maybe maybe a little over an eighth of an inch and i just put my needle into the fabric i'm touching maybe touching the the paper but not actually going through the paper so i'm catching both this inner layer this um i guess this red and white dot and the black fabric. And then I'm going to pull through till I get to my knot. And I'm going to make a stitch there. And then I'm going to scoot up towards the end and make another stitch. And I'm going to scoot up a little bit more. Sometimes it's two stitches, sometimes it's three stitches. I usually make stitches about uh, maybe a, an eighth to a sixteenth of an inch. When I get to the corner, I make another stitch. Then I start back down. The only reason I do that is because I really don't want a big knot in the very corner because you're going to hook lots of hexes together and where, you, where you're going to have two or three hexes together is going to be at the corner. Then I'm just going to come right down and make little tiny whip stitches. This is a whip stitch. And you can kind of feel the paper as you're going through there. And then you're just trying to stay out of it. When you feel that paper, just go to the top or side of it. When you get to the end, try not to un- You know what? I forgot to turn on that light back there. I don't know if that would help or not. It seems like it's pretty light though. Are there any questions? Anybody have a question yet? Because if you do, I'm 
I'm not here to help. I'm not going to promise anything. Okay, now I'm going to get to the end. Almost to this end, and I wish I could show you close. Uh, Off. Pull that down. There we go. I don't know how many stitches are over there. You don't need a certain amount. You just need them fairly close together because you don't want. You're taking little stitches and you're just taking it in the fabric layer. So that when you open it up, hopefully you can't see those stitches. If you see them, this is where you see them as this right there in that edge. Okay, now we are we're at the end. We're at the end here, so we're ready to add on another of our inner ring. So let's get another one out. And okay, so I'm right here. So I'm going to put one next to it. And I don't know. Sometimes I say, well, do I want it to lay this way? Do I want it to lay this way? I think I like that one. So I flip it back on the other white one. And now I am going to sew from that end, sewing two of the inner ring together. And then here is the white with the red blotches on it. Can't really call this white or red. I guess you could call it red. So then I when I map the very end at this corner, I make two or three stitches there. And then I head back to the other corner. Okay. And then you're going to, when you get to this other corner, I'm not going to go all the way there. When you get to this corner, you're going to have to stop. So I'll go one more here. Yeah. Maybe I'll go to the end so that we can see. You can see, you can do this while you're watching TV. You can do this while you're riding in the car if it's not too bumpy. You don't need to have superior eyesight to, to do this. When I get to this end, remember I don't really like those knots in the corner, so I'm going to go back. Can I go? back about a quarter of an inch, or maybe an eighth, and I'm going to make a knot. Okay, now I have it sewn together, these two sewn together, but this guy isn't sewn. So this is when I have to, I've kind of gone about this crazy because now I have to go and what I'm going to have to do is make a knot and I'm going to start right here and I'm going to sew down to here. Now let me just show you. Make a knot. And so back down. When I make this knot in this corner, sometimes I start way back here and pull my knot through. And that way, 
I can go up here and do two or three. When, on this guy, when I can, I like to lay this flat down on a surface. Usually I have a sewing, my sewing box on my lap, and I lay it as flat, flat out. And then this is much easier to sew. Well, I say that, and I'm not doing Because it doesn't matter how, how big your stitch is on this side. Because it's not showing. And if you have them flat, it's much easier to get the thread through, the needle to poke through there, and not have it show on the other side. So as often as I can, I like to have them fairly flat, because you can't hardly see on the other side when you do that. So then I would go ahead and zip down to this corner. And we're going to pretend that I have done that because I have another one already to go, which is like I think it's this one. Okay. So in fact, this one I guess I've done one, two, three. So what you're going to do basically is you keep adding on, you add on one there and then your second one and then you go back you can't keep going around in your ring instead after you get one on you always have to the second row of stitches is going to be to hook the inner ring to the center so i'm ready to do where's my needle i have my needle there so i'm ready to do this so i lay him there flip him back so that i can Make sure he's going in the right direction. And then I have a needle here with some thread in it. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to head to the, I'm going to make a double or a triple stitch right at the corner. And then I'm going to head up to the end of the line. Go to the end of the line. And then I'm going to have to, when I get to the end here, I'm going to have to knot it off again. Flip it over and then stitch that. So you always stitch these two together and then stitch it to the center. Then you go around until you have all six of them together. And then you just, when you have the six inner hexes on, then you just stick an outer one on and you keep going in the exact same way. Now the outer ones, you're going to have to do twice as many, but it's the same general idea. You keep sewing everybody until, until they're hooked to the center and then to each, to each other and then to the guys that were before them. Okay, so when we get, I'm going to get to this end and I'm going to not. So now this guy's done. He's still loose here. I can't go on to my next one until I sew this one. So I would stick him there, lay him down, and sew from here down. And then I don't have to do anything. I can add my next guy on. And then add the last guy on. So, that one would be finished. When you have them finished. Well, maybe. Any questions? If there's any questions, just let me know now, because we are moving on, moving on. Does your acrylic pattern have a solid or center cutout and one fourth or three inch of seed lines? Okay. This acrylic cutout has a, it's got a center line. It's clear. Let me show it to you really close. It's, I think I don't know where I got this. This, this came from paperpieces.com. 
and it's called ACR Hex 100 because it's a one inch hexagon and it has this uh, white line around here which shows the center, which shows the actual hexagon. And then this is three eighths of an inch on each side going around it. So I really like them. I, they're not super expensive, I don't think. I think I got mine at the back door and it was, it's been a while, but it was $6.50. So I don't know, it might be more than that now, but they are just very helpful. But like I said, you can always use scissors and a pencil to get you started. That's a good question. Okay. When you have your hexes all together, like this one, another question. You always use a one inch hexi. Oh, good question. Um, I do for the flower hugs and for a lot of things just simply because I have a mess of them and that's a nice size. But I also in I also have other paper pieces and I also have hex or acrylic cutouts to cut the other pieces. So they make these acrylic cutters in uh, like one and a quarter inch hexes, two inch hexes. I think they do them for, um, well, I know they do them for uh, these, these, these were done with a jewel shape, jewel shape, but um, I have the cutter for them. I don't know if I have the cutter. I think I did have the cutter. I did these with the freezer paper and these did not get put into the quilt but I think they come in the the cutters come in different sizes and but I always well let me see in the last couple of years I have mainly stuck with the one inch pixies simply because they're easy to use for the flower hugs and for making other quilts with. but you can use you can use the same method for lots of different ones. Okay, when you have your hex sheet done, then you you have the paper in all of the pieces and I leave the paper, always leave the paper on the outside on. But I do, because you can reuse these papers, I do snip the stitches on the inside ones just nip those basting stitches and take out the papers and then I've got them to use again. You can reuse these many, many times. Now the ones that you, if you glue really heavily, you can still use them. But, um, I only take, I only take out the inner ring though. I do not take out the outer ring. Um, but when I am, after I have chosen from that big pile that I showed you of the Pepsi choices, once I have chosen one, then I will, as I'm making the flower hug, I will take out, during the process, I will take out this outer ring. But I leave them in there until I'm ready to actually sew them onto something. So, all right. So we take the papers out. Um, oh, if you're left-handed, when you're basting, and probably when you're sewing your hexes together, you probably go in the other direction. I tend to go left, or counterclockwise, you probably would go clockwise with that. I'm sure that you uh, figure that out with lots of other things. Okay, so that's how we make a hexi flower. There were a couple of other things I wanted to show you. Oh, really quick. Um, I do use them for the 
flower hugs. Do we have a picture of the flower hugs that we could show? We have some right behind me. Here are some possibilities. You can use the hexes. These make about a nine or nine and a half inch, maybe nine inch. Let me see. Yeah, they make about a nine inch flower. So when I'm designing what I'm going to do with them, there's a lot of times when I'll just think, well, well, hi, Odie. Okay, so I will just figure in my head that it's going to be a nine inch flower if I'm going to put them on a block, because I don't always put them together, you know, like a grandmother flower. Them. But when I, I like to applique them down, so then I kind of think, well, no, I'm going to have to have a block that's at least 10 to 11, 12 inches. Oh, and there's a flower hub already to show you that's one way you can use your EPP flowers. Another way might be in this flower hug pattern, you can use the hexes to make table runners. You can make a, um, oh, you probably can't see that. Uh, you can make placemats, table runners, whatever. There's the table runner. The next, what's the next slide there? Is that um, the ro uh, what's it called? purple mist? You can use them for a whole quilt. This is purple mist. And here I think those are, I don't know if they're 10 inch blocks. I don't remember. But I put them with some triangle blocks and very <laughs> for our bed I wanted something that was big and I used now those are not hexes those are oh, I don't know what those shapes are called I think they were called chrysanthemum and they were done with paper piecing and I think that quilt's like 105 by 105, but I really like it, and, and the quilting is beautiful. I do the quilting, Kathy Franks did the quilting, but it's just, it's one of my faves. But that shows you, you don't have to sew your hexes together in like a normal grandmother flower garden. Oh, and here's another paper pieced project. This is called Badminton Anyone. This uses, I think, um, I forget what these are called. This is another kind of paper piecing. Um, and I, I have a, somewhere, I must have, I have Oh, I know. It's this. Show me that picture again. <laughs> Show that badminton anything. The badminton anyone came because the quilt before it, the one with all the big chrysanthemum flowers, I had extras and I wanted to use them. And so I thought, now these are not a very good color. These are kind of a rust color. But I thought, oh, if I just put four or five together, and then I put a green circle that sort of looked like a flower bud. Um, and then when I put them on the quilt and put the quilt together, everyone said it doesn't look like a flower. It looks like a badminton movie. So that became badminton in anyway. But uh, that's a good way to use your ink, or another way to use English paper PC. A long time ago, I, no, not that long. Ago, maybe 10 years ago or so, I used, these are called jewel pieces, and I had a mess of them, and I thought they looked sort of like star flowers. So I put them together, and this is what came about. It, it's called Grandmother's Jewels. In fact, I had made these, and I made and made and made and made, so I had about 30 or 40 of them, and then I tried to find something that I wanted to put them on. So it took me three or four quilts before I finally decided Grandmother's Jewels was the best one. So, um, and that's, was there another one after that? 
there, or is that the last picture? One more. Oh, one more, and it's made by Therese Graves. Mm -hmm. Oh, no. There's another one after this. Oh, oh, oh. This is called Flower Shower. This is using the one-inch hexes. Now, it's not a pattern. And if you think it should be a pattern, then let me know because... I like it, but I didn't know. It's a little more work making the background because it has all those little zigzags on it. But I really like it, and I think it's a pretty, pretty cool. And it shows you you can take a half square triangles, make them big, and just applique your flowers anywhere that you feel like doing it. Um, I think. That's the most fun for me. Find a very plain background and then applique the, the flowers on top. This last or this next last picture is a grandmother flower garden that I made years and years ago. And it's hand quilted. And as you can see, it's, I don't know, it kind of has a, um, an age look to it. It's probably been washed a bunch. Maybe that's it. But we take it camping. <laughs> and I, I still like it. I think those flower hugs are bigger. I think those are probably one and a half or two, you know, one and a half inch. Because they're definitely bigger than this one. And finally, I have a picture of one that Therese Graves made. She used the one inch hexes. And she put them together with the leaves that are in this pattern. And I just thought she did a really cool job of making a circular flower uh, table i guess it's a, a table topper so i thought that was a great way there you can sew them together and then put the leaves on the outside so there you go that's all i know well i think it might be all i know about english paper piecing if you're interested and um would like to know more there's two kinds of paper piecing. There's English paper piecing, which is EPP, and there's foundation paper piecing, which is FPP. I use, in this pattern, I use English paper piecing for the flowers, and I use foundation paper piecing to make the leaves. I also use the same leaf pattern to make this, um, Ferris wheel flowers. I really like. It's a very easy pattern to learn foundation paper piecing with. If you're interested, I am thinking of doing something similar with the foundation paper piecing perhaps next week. So if you're interested, let me know and I will put it on a um, pick a day and we'll have it next week. Or, yeah. Okay, enough for now. Go out and get busy sewing your PPP. Thank you. Bye.